Well, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, that's right there. And good evening, or assalamu alaikum, as they say in Detroit. <laughs> now, in Britain, as you know, we take the adversarial principle rather further than you do. We don't just have adversarial courtrooms, we have an adversarial parliament and an adversarial press, and we have adversarial families. And I know I'm going to be asked all kinds of foolish questions about whether we got on and what our childhood was like. I would say that it had its ups and downs. My father at one point forced us, in a scenario similar to that at uh, Dayton, Ohio, to sign a peace treaty, uh, which I later repudiated by breaking the frame open and tearing it to shreds. And we would spend long summers drenching each other with uh, what was available to hand in those days before the super soaker, which was uh, used washing up liquid bottles. And since then, we've really kept our hands off each other, more or less. Tonight, those of you who are hoping for a session of mud wrestling will, I hope, be disappointed. But I, I can offer you one small thrill, which is that it seems to me, uh, and it seems to me the closer I've got to this evening, that I don't ever want to do this again. <laughs> So there is a very strong chance that this will be the last time we shall ever do this. Turning to the subject under discussion, uh, the war in Iraq. I don't want to make this too easy for myself because it seems to me that it is actually a fantastically easy position to take. First of all, I'll confess that at the beginning, for some time, my mind was not made up. I considered supporting it and almost everything in my past made me want to do so. One of the reasons that I didn't was the rank stupidity of much of the propaganda in its favour. And I was particularly struck by an article by Michael Kinsley in which he said that the people who want this war are treating their own arguments with contempt. But one of the reasons that I would have and would have expected myself to support it is that, and this is bound to come up in the first half as well as the second half, the religion that I grew up with in England was not what you might think. The Christianity of England by that time was a pallid, anemic thing. The thing that we were all brought up to believe in was in something called We Won the War. Its saints were the pilots of the Battle of Britain. Its God was Winston Churchill. And it suffused everything we did. We lived, you must remember, in this wonderful, peaceful country, largely untouched by foreign attack, in a land honorably battered by war. I was surrounded. The, the cities that we lived in or near, my father was a naval officer, our father, I should say, on this evening. Uh, we lived in cities battered by war, or near cities battered by war, and everything even as small children that we talked about was overshadowed by that war and we thought that it had been good. In fact, we were convinced that it had been good and we grew up entirely believing that you could, by launching war, do good things. As time has passed and as I have travelled to the nastier places of the world, I have become less sure of this. And I've seen more and more the consequences of those pictures which we so often see on our television screens of the missile being launched from the ship, of what happens at the other end. And I've seen also, on a particular and terrifying occasion in Somalia, the arrival of the US Marines intent on rescuing a country in desperate, desperate straits. And the subsequent failure despite the enormous good intentions of everybody involved. But there was something else about the Iraq war that I didn't like. And that was this, and it was particularly just as it began, and as I was beginning to feel most strongly that I didn't like it, uh, a rear admiral of the United States Navy, and of course I feel rather strongly about navies because of my parentage, was portrayed on the television addressing his ship's company. This was not a stirring or poetic oration. It concluded with the words, it's hammer time, and this was succeeded by a playing of a song called, We Will Rock You. <laughs> well, yes, it is quite funny, except that what they then did was to launch missiles which headed towards a country where they would land, 
inevitably in some cases, on places where entirely innocent people were living. I didn't think this was a serious attitude towards war. I was reminded continuously, and I have to say I have a largely conservative audience in Britain, and I said repeatedly that I, I didn't like this war and I would get angry emails, phone calls and letters saying that I was unpatriotic and wrong. And I would send back one thing to most of these people, which was Kipling's recessional. And Admiral Keating's outburst made me think most strongly of that, uh, that particular passage. We lose wild... Uh, I should have written this down, remembered it, I, I remembered it earlier on. Drunk with sight of power, we lose wild tongues that have not thee in awe. And of the reeking tube, an iron shard upon which the heathen rely. And I thought there was an arrogance about this war and a belief flowing from self-righteousness and misdirected idealism which was bound to end in disaster. And I thought of my own country at the end of the 19th century embarking on the Boer War and ending essentially its imperial power by its overweening folly. And I thought, not merely wrong, but a mistake. And nothing, absolutely nothing, which has happened since, and I have been to Iraq twice since that war took place, has convinced me in any way that I was wrong. This was an idealist war. It was an idealist war supported by idealists for the best of reasons. And it fulfilled my belief that there is nothing in this world more terrifying than somebody who thinks he is right. Thank you, Peter. Christopher, you have 10 minutes.